At the tone, 8 o'clock. Remember, a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. Tonight from Hollywood, the makers of Hallmark cards bring you an unusual true story on the Hallmark Hall of Fame. And here is our distinguished host, Mr. Lionel Barrymore. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome once again to the Hallmark Hall of Fame. Tonight, we are taking you back to the year 1836, when wagons were on the move across the face of Texas. On the move, yes, but there was something wrong. These wagons were moving east, not west. There's quite a story behind this strange mass movement of the defeated and despairing men and women. A story that might have ended in defeat had it not been for one man. What this man did and how he did it is the story we're going to tell you tonight. And now, here's Frank Goss from the makers of Hallmark Cards. Tonight, the makers of Hallmark Cards and the fine stores that feature them are happy to bring you the first program in the new winter series of the Hallmark Hall of Fame. Throughout the season, we hope you'll enjoy these dramatic stories, made even more exciting because they are true stories taken from the lives of great individuals. And we hope that when you want to remember friends or relatives in a special way, you'll remember Hallmark Cards. Lionel Barrymore appears by arrangement with Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, soon to release Dory Sherry's production, Take the High Ground, starring Richard Widmark, Carl Malden, and Elaine Stewart. And now Mr. Barrymore brings you tonight's exciting story on the Hallmark Hall of Fame. It was an incredible sight. These wagons moving east across the purple grandeur of the endless plain, their golden dust hanging in the sunlight, incredible. These pioneer Americans had come to Texas with the invitation of the Mexican government. They come and, uh, to give their strength and their skill and their spirit to the fabulous new land, a promised land. Why then were they now making their exodus? What had happened? Ma? Yes, son? Why didn't Pa come with us? He went to join up with General Sam Houston, son. I know that, but why? Oh, there are reasons and reasons. The proclamation, for one thing. I declare he studied that proclamation quite a spell before he made up his Citizens of Texas. There comes a time when men must choose between freedom and oppression, and these Texans have chosen freedom. The Mexicans under the ruthless Santa Ana had marched north, determined to put an end to their demands for the rights of free men. The Texans formed a provisional government sent their women and children back to the United States and told Sam Houston to build them an army. Our invader has sworn to extinguish us or sweep us from the soil. He is vigilant in his work of oppression and has ordered to Texas 10,000 men to enforce his ambition. We will enjoy our birthright or perish in its defense. The services of volunteers will be accepted. By the 1st of March next, we must meet the enemy with an army worthy of our cause. Let the brave rally to our standard. Signed, Sam Houston, Commander-in-Chief of the Army. By order, George W. Poe, Acting Adjutant General. Citizens of Texas, under the Constitution of Mexico, you were invited to Texas, then the wilderness. 
You rented it to cultivated country. You swore to support that constitution, and you have. But now you've realized the horrors of anarchy and dictation. The promises made to you have not been fulfilled. The agents you have sent to Mexico have been imprisoned. And still you have remained loyal with the hope that liberty would not perish in the Republic of Mexico. But while you are fondly cherishing this hope, the dictator required to surrender Let the brave rally to our standard. They did. And in the United States, young men everywhere were reading a poster. Well, go on, spell it out. What's it say? Um, volunteers from the United States will receive liberal bounties of land. Come with a good rifle and come soon. Liberty or death, down with the usurper. It's signed Sam Houston. Him what used to be governor of Tennessee? Yep. Huh. You know, I think I'll go. Why? For the free land? Heck no, man. I'm going for the fight. There were recruiting stations for volunteers in Cincinnati, New Orleans, and Louisville. What'd you do today? Same as you, Whitey. Drilling. You like to drill the juice out of us. Drilling. I come down to Texas for to shoot me some Spaniards. You and me, we should have gone on down to San Antonio with old Ben Milam. Yeah, they got a roof over their heads in San Antonio. No. Sure, a whole mess of them's garrison in the mission now. We got to stay here with the general. Oh, well, he ain't so bad. I just wish he'd make up his mind to fight, that's all. Rough over the heads, huh? What's the name of that place they at? I think it's called Alamo. Santa Ana's legions pushed northeast to San Antonio. Defending it was a tiny force of Texans. Great Americans will remember their names always. Davy Crockett, Jim Bowie, James Butler Bonham, Bill Travis. Every darn one of them. Wiped out. Why don't he do something? Sam Houston, he's supposed to be such a great general. Why don't he do something besides drill us and march us all over the countryside? Captain says this is what they call tactics. Tactics? <laughs> I call it yellow. You want to know something? Just between you and me? What? That's what the captain called it, too. Now, let's get some sleep. dead numbered 187. Santa Ana's forces continued to move across Texas, murdering, burning, looting as they came. To the southwest of San Antonio, a spot forever known as the Goliad, the Mexican forces encountered the 300 brave volunteers of Colonel Jimmy Fan, surrounded them, marched them out to a field, and killed them all in cold blood to the last man. And Sam Houston, well, he continued his retreat. April 12, 1836, Harrisburg, Texas, General Houston. There is nothing to stop the march of the enemy now to this place or Galveston in 24 hours. The country expects something from you. The government looks to you for action. Are we to give up the country and make our way out of it? Or are we to meet the enemy and make at least one struggle for our boasted independence? The government does not intend to control your movements, but it is expected that you will take measures without delay to check the enemy's movements. Signed, the President. General Houston, sir. Scout D. Smith reporting. Hello, D. Well, Sam, it's done. Oh? Sam Phillippe. Folks is gone, burned it to the ground for the left. 
I guess it had to be. I got some other news for you, too, Sam. Oh, go on. Another detachment pulled out last night. Deserted back to the state. Said they come to fight, not retreat. Said that, eh? Men are spoiling for some action, Sam. They aren't ready. There'll be more deserting tonight and tomorrow. Well, we'll make out as best we can. All right, Sam. But if only you could say something to them, give them some heart. When the time comes, I'll say plenty. Until then, they're soldiers. And the Lord grant that they shall act as such. in the swamps, Leroy. Ask old Sam. Don't ask me. Sandy and has got four columns chasing us. How come we don't stop and fight them? That's what we come here for. Yeah. Sleeping out in the swamps. Marching backwards all the time. Wish we had old Stonewall Jackson here. He'd show that Sandy and what a fight is. Shh. Here comes an officer. What do I care if it's an officer coming? Shush. Shush your own self. Only wished it was Sam Houston. I tell him what I think of this fast retreating bunch of patriots. What's that, sir? It's him. Did I hear you say something, soldier? I, uh, yes, I did. And what was it? Well, General, I don't think you're fighting this thing right. You don't? No, sir. Do you know what we're up against? Nothing but that General Sandy Annie. What's your name, soldier? White, sir, Jeremiah White. White? I'll tell you about General Santa Ana. He has four armies, totaling over 10,000 men. They're professional soldiers, well armed. They have 10 cannon to each one of ours. They have fine horses. And they have unlimited reserves of money, White. And money is important. What are we? Just 700 men. 700? But they're good men, White, and when the time comes, they'll show well. Yes, sir. The odds are 10 or 12 to 1, you see. Now, if you had to fight 10 or 12 men, would you do it out in an open field where they could come at you from all sides? Uh, well, or would you wait and retreat and try to maneuver them into a position where you'd stand some sort of chance? I guess I'd maneuver them, John. Well, that's what we're doing, White. And we're going to keep right on maneuvering them. And I don't care what the president of Texas or any other fireside tacticians may say. We're going to maneuver them. And then when they've got them with a place and the time is right, we're going to hit them. Hit and crush and kill and win. Yes, sir. You may depend on it. In just a moment, we return to the second act of the Hallmark Hall of Fame. Isn't it good to think that friendship, the one best thing we have to give away, can't be measured by cost? You could no more put a price tag on thoughtfulness and kindness than you could on the beauty of an autumn day. Yet the act of being friendly is often such a simple one. A visit to welcome a new neighbor, a cheerful greeting to someone who is ill, a word of praise and encouragement. I think you'll agree that the happiest people you know are those who have developed the wonderful talent of giving. And one of the nicest ways for you to remember all your friends and loved ones in these busy days is by sending Hallmark cards. They're the symbols of friendship. They can carry your thoughts to the farthest corners of the world. It takes so little time. It takes so little money to send a heartwarming Hallmark card. And here's something good to know. Even though the quality of Hallmark cards has improved through the years, their prices remain the same. And you can count on it. That hallmark on the back tells your friends you cared enough to send the very best. And now Lionel Barrymore brings you the second act of our true story of Sam Houston. Forty days and forty nights, Sam Houston maneuvered his ragged army across the scorched earth of Texas. While the people prayed and the politicians safely distant cursed. I say that man is incompetent. That's what I say. He sure ought to stand up and fight like Travis and Fannin did. Well, it's been weeks and weeks and still he's retreating. 
No wonder they run him out of Tennessee. Yes, me. He ought to be run out of Texas. Scouts brought Sam Houston, the colored man, who had this to say. Uh, they released me, General. Uh, the Mexicans did. And Santa Ana, uh, he said I was to come and tell you he knows just where you is. He said first, he going to catch up with them land thieves, uh, but that meaning the Texas government. And then he's going to come out of you and smoke you out. Going after them, huh? Yes, sir. Deep Smith, give me that map. Here you are, Sam. Mm. Now... Look here, Deef. Yeah. Here, where Buffalo Bayou meets the San Jacinto Bay. Reckon we can swim the horses and men? Reckon. Mm. Look here, Deef. San Jacinto. There's one way in right here where we swim it. Yeah. And one way out up here at Vince's Bridge. Mighty nice. If and they come that way. Santa Ana's got to come that way. If he wants to get to our president, he's got to. And when he does, we'll be ready. Sam Houston led his men to San Jacinto and made ready for Santa Ana's confident thousands. They made camp on a wooded bluff, threw up earthworks, and prepared their meager artillery and waited. See anything? Some dust out there across the river. That could be them. Mm hmm. Hey, listen. Yonder they come! Why? The general says, hold your fire. Hold your fire. Ever since the Alamo, I've been waiting for this. I think we'd better. I got an idea Sam Houston knows what he's doing. Finally. Yeah, finally. Seven hundred tents and waiting men watched Santa Ana's troops cross the river onto San Jacinto and head for Vince's Bridge. They watched and waited through the long afternoon. And then... Santa Ana's forces pulled in immediately and regrouped. As darkness fell, there was no more fighting that afternoon. No order to charge had been given, and this was the real test of discipline. For these men were proud, and they'd had enough running. In the darkness, they watched the not-too-distant fires of Santa Yana's camp, and they waited for orders. Gentlemen, we have never to date held a council of war. Despite the fact that you, the six officers of my staff, and you, Mr. Secretary, have repeatedly asked for such. I know that several of you have been most critical of my actions in this campaign. So be it. Now, I'd like a straight and honest answer from each of you as to what should be done. The question I put to you is this. Shall we attack the enemy in position or receive their attack in ours. You, Mr. Secretary, what is your opinion? Uh, well, uh, we, uh, well, that is the senior officers and myself, have discussed this matter, General, and are in accord. Your situation here is strong, and you're to be commended. By holding this position, you can stand off all of Mexico. Now, to attack, on the other hand, uh, to charge upon the enemy without bayonets and in the open prairie, such as we have spread out below us, is a maneuver unprecedented in the history of warfare. And um, we, we strongly advise against uh, uh, e e even the consideration uh, of the tactic. Uh, yeah, we agree. Thank you, gentlemen. Good night. <laughs> You send for me, Sam? I did, Deef. Got a gift for you and a chore. Axes? You ain't aiming to make me cut kindling wood, I say. <laughs> Something like that. Now listen, here's what I want you to do. Tomorrow morning, I want you to take your best scout and ride south to 
these two acts. Sam Houston had played for the place and won. Now he played for the time. The Mexican troops were good, and they were tough, and they could fight. Well, he knew this. They could go without food and without water. Well, he knew that. He also knew one other thing. They could not and would not go without their siesta. Gentlemen, soldiers of Texas, we attack at 30 minutes past three of the afternoon. Victory is such. Trust in God and fear not. And remember the Alamo. Remember Goliath. Remember the Alamo. in our history as pent up as Sam Houston's 700 men racing down upon the camp of sleeping Mexicans. They were less than a hundred yards from the sentries of Santa Yana's when Deep Smith, brandishing an axe in each hand, rode along their line with a ferocious grin. He'd come for just one thing to say. Vincent Bridge is down and they can't get away! At the Alamo, the swaggering Santa Yana had ordered the sounding of no quarter. Now the Texans did the same. The Mexicans were thrown back to the water, and there were many of them drowned. Others crowded on the bank and were massacred by the onrushing Texans. Still others surrendered in droves, and were surprised in view of what had happened at Goliad when their lives were spared. Eighteen minutes from the first cry of charge, the Battle of San Jacinto was over, and Texas was born as a nation. And what of Sam Houston? Well, the battle was over. He lay on a litter, his ankles shattered by a musket ball, no canopy over his head save the blue canopy of heaven. No money, no medals, but a sense of peace and of satisfaction such as few men have ever known. He'd been writing. White. Yes, sir. You and that other man, I want you to ride to the Capitol with this message. Yes, sir, General. It's a um, proclamation. I hope it sounds right. I'm sure it does, General. Can you read, White? No, sir, but Leroy here. He can Read it back to me, Leroy. To the troops and people of the East, express. Tell our friends all the news and that we have beaten the enemy and have taken prisoners, General Santa Ana and Coase, in three general standards. Vast amount of property taken in about 1,500 stands of arms, many swords, in one nine-pounder brass cannon. Tell them to come on. Tell them to come on and let the people come and plant corn. That's signed respectfully, Sam Houston, Commander-in-Chief, Texas. And let the people come and plant corn. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's dark tonight across the great face of Texas. Something in the velvety sky, somewhere, a star looks down. And by its light, you can see the crops standing tall and rich in the cool night air. The people have come, General, and tomorrow they'll be harvesting. Yeah, thank you, Sam. Thank you, Sam Houston. And now I, I, I'd like 
like to add a personal word uh, and just tell you how delighted I am to be back with all of you as we start another year on the Hallmark Hall of Fame. I'm delighted, too, to be continuing my warm association with my good friends, the makers of Hallmark cards, and the fine stores that feature Hallmark cards. And believe me, I just can't wait to tell you all about the stories we've lined up for your pleasure these coming weeks. These stories prove what I've always maintained, that the real lives of actual men and women are more exciting and more surprising and downright more entertaining than anything fiction writers can dream up. But before we tell you about some of the people we're going to honor on the Hallmark Hall of Fame, here's my friend Frank Goss, who's going to take you on a little trip. Most of us agree that fine stores are pretty dramatic places to visit in the early fall. Shipments are arriving almost every hour. Counters are sparkling with a variety of new merchandise. Everywhere there's the sense of cool weather activity and a hint of the exciting holidays ahead. Tonight, I'd like to recommend one shopping trip I know you'll enjoy. That's a visit to a store where Hallmark cards are sold to see the new Hallmark gift wraps. You see, styles and Hallmark gift wraps change each season, just as styles and clothing do. And this year, the assortment of papers with enclosure cards and ribbons to match is lovelier than ever. And you'll discover exciting new ways to express your thoughtfulness. For instance, you'll want to see the new Hallmark gift trim the colorful decorations that give a package a special individual look. Yes, one way to be sure your gifts express your good taste, outside as well as inside, is to look for the Hallmark and Crown on all the gift wrap items you choose. It's the same Hallmark you always look for on the back of cards, when you care enough to send the very best. And now here again is Lionel Barrymore. Oh, thanks. Thanks, Frank. Thank you very much. I always like to listen to you tell about the wonderful ways Hallmark cards help us to be thoughtful and friendly. Well, now, Frank, how about giving a little preview of what's to come on the Hallmark Hall of Fame? Well, Mr. Barrymore, just to give a few examples, we're going to honor Marcus Whitman, the remarkable frontier doctor who fought his way from Oregon to Washington, D.C., and we're going to honor Mary Ann Bickerdyke, the courageous young woman who was a real angel of mercy, and we'll tell, too, the story of Squanto, the Cockney Indian, and William Newton Byers, the two-gun journalist. And there'll be fascinating glimpses into the lives of such famous people as Benjamin Franklin, Simone Bolivar, and Madame Curie. And next week, we're going to honor the great American musician George Gershwin and tell the little-known story of how he came to compose the unforgettable Rhapsody in Blue. I know you'll want to be with us next week when we honor George Gershwin and every week to come. Until next week, then, this is Lionel Barrymore saying good night. Look for Hallmark cards that are sold only in stores that have been carefully selected to give you expert and friendly service. Remember a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. Our producer-director is William Gay. Our script tonight was written by James Poe. Sam Houston was played by John Daner. Featured in our cast tonight were Margaret Brayton, Richard Beals, Herb Butterfield, Sam Edwards, Harry Bartell, Lawrence Dobkin, Ted DeCorsia, Polly Bear, William Johnstone, and Roy Glenn. This is Frank Goss saying goodnight to you all until next week at the same time when we present another true-to-life story of actual persons who in their own way have contributed to a better world for all of us to live in. Next week, we honor George Gershwin on the Hallmark Hall of Fame. This is the CBS Radio Network. This is KMBC, Kansas City, Missouri.